For today's Matrix Wissen interview, I'm joined with Grandmaster Wolf. He lives in Australia and is a mystic, an ordained Taoist monk, a philosopher, a certified clinical hypnotherapist, and a mentalist. I became aware of him through his YouTube channel, where he shows some pretty amazing telekinesis skills. While we will also spend some time talking about telekinesis during this interview, I would first like to know a bit more about you and who you are. So can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work you do? Okay. Nice to see you again, Oliver. <laughs> Thank you for this interview. A little bit about myself. I, I don't really know what to say about myself. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what to say about myself. There's nothing I can say. Uh, you can prompt me, please. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's start up. What are you doing right now as uh, as a work uh, right now? Oh, I see. I see. Um, exactly what I'm doing now. Um, before the videos went up. I think about a year or so ago, um, I was earning my living just by being, really. Uh, people come see me, I, I can give them advice, I give them help. Um, I have a clinic, I have a Kung Fu school, uh, and I also do lectures and talks around the world, although not that often. Um, and that feeds me, which is all I really need, is to keep the vehicle going. And life goes on. It's pretty much that simple. I love life. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's, that that's, a, that's a healthy attitude to love. Life is always good. That means I love myself. Ah, there you go. Sorry. Let's. Uh, next okay. question. <laughs> Okay, well then maybe uh, let's go a little bit through your life, uh, starting up a little bit earlier. So I knew from a few people uh, who are mystics or spiritually wise individuals that um, they had some unusual childhood experiences or maybe also either paranormal or traumatic. And uh, I would just uh, be interested whether you had anything unusual happen in the early stages of your life, which you still remember and which you're willing to share. Absolutely. Interesting question. I guess for me, I was perhaps four or five years old and I started having either hallucinations or visions. I'm still not quite sure which. Um, strange thing, sitting on the couch as a, a small child and suddenly the, the wall opening up and huge, big monolithic boulders rolling down grassy hillsides towards me and scaring the hell out of me. Um, people standing at the end of my bed today, I realized were disembodied people just standing there watching me when I was a child. Um, of course, like any child, I would scream and I was told, don't worry, it's just my imagination, which is something I wouldn't suggest anyone say to their children. It takes the power away from you. So basically visions, by the time I was nine or ten, I was thinking about um, death and ghosts and things that I guess you shouldn't be thinking about as a child, but I had questions, things were happening to me. The visions I was having or hallucinations were happening quite regularly, extremely different, each one, never the same, the same storyline. By the time I got to high school, I was so interested in life, the mind, the third eye, that, that fascinated me for ages. Somewhere along the line in preschool, I was told by, uh, and this is perhaps where it started for me for real, I was told by the science teacher that um, everything we see is because, I'll start, I'll back up a little bit here. The eyes that we have can only see what blocks light. You understand what I mean by that? Light has to hit an object, bounce off the object, hit you in the eyes, it goes through the lenses into your brain and somewhere in the center of your brain you form a picture from that. When we hear someone makes a noise, the noise, the vibrations of their throat moves the air, the air moves your eardrum and by the time it's done that it's passed through several different materials, air, oxygen, hydrogen, skin, 
all the rest of it. So what leaves the person's mouth is not the same noise that you're hearing in your ear. Neither is music by that same thing. Um, touch, same thing. You get touch, sensations, you end up feeling it in your head somewhere. So that horrified me because I'd been alive, you know, more than a decade at that point, and I've just been told that I've never, ever been outside my head. I have never, ever experienced the outside world. And that shocked me and it horrified me, and that's what set me on my way. Because of that, I didn't have a very good schooling because I wasn't really listening to what was being said because it wasn't very long after that because I went inward and started to, you know, wonder how do I get out of this brain thing and what am I in this brain in the first place that wants to get out. Um, I started to realise, watching my thoughts, watching people talk, realizing that they're speaking and I'm making up the meaning in my own head finished that for me it finished my want to be in everyday society because it wasn't going the same way that my interests were taking me I'll back up a little bit and explain what I mean by the last comment when you are talking to me you are making a noise and I am making up the meaning in my head Therefore, I'm not hearing what you're saying. I'm just making things up in my own head. Therefore, I'm talking to myself. That horrified me as well. I'm not horrified at these things anymore. It's quite normal once you understand the human condition. But that's where it started. And 60 years later, here I am. And this is what it produces. I'm not sure which one to look at here. I've got two pictures looking at me here. Did that answer your question? Sure, it did. Um, so what I take away from that is also that um, you never really had the the phase in your life where you get completely disconnected from that aspect, the spiritual or so, because I know some people, when they enter school and they get all the left brain training, they kind of have a short materialistic phase in their life and then they later on come back, but you never really had that. Do I understand that correctly from your... You said? Yes, yes, I... Um... I have no interest in the delusionary world or the, the delusions of the world that we are brought up to believe. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know where else to go with that, Oliver. Uh, it's, it's okay. So maybe then uh, let's move on a little bit further in your life. So I know uh, from your website that uh, you had quite a few different teachers in your life. On the website, you mentioned the Dalai Lama, Jiddu Krishnamurti, several enlightened masters. Um, you've lived at different temples in the Himalayas and in the remote mountains of China. So uh, can you give us a really brief rundown of, of the next years after you left school? After I left school? Goodness <laughs> me. <laughs> After I left school, the first thing I did was this. You have to understand Australia before I tell you the next piece. Australia is an extremely big country. It's very easy to get lost if you want to. It's very easy to get lost. If you don't want to, it's even easier to get lost. Some people can walk six days and still be in, be in their own backyard. That's how big it is here. So when I left school, because I was very young, I was very scared. I had um, I had a brutal upbringing that I won't go into too much. Um, I needed to get away and have a look back at what was happening in life. I needed to get away and have a look at the conditioning and why it wasn't working. I had to get away and ask questions. Of course, at this stage, I already read a few so-called spiritual books, you know, Krishnamurti being one of them because uh, he's been around a long time, he's a very prolific writer, or there's a lot of books on his stuff. So that was one of the first things that I came across. But also in the 60s, growing up, trying to find out these things, you're looking, you're trying to find answers to your questions. Why is life so painful? What the hell is this all about? What am I doing here again? Um... And back then, in the 60s, what you were offered what, uh, were drugs, strange gurus, strange practices. Alistair Crowley, who's an occultist of the 
the beginning of the century, last century, is a very uh, used to do things with Madame Blavatsky and the Order of the Golden Dawn and occultism and all the rest of it. I went through all of that as I was going through high school. I became a member of the Golden Dawn. I became a member of the OTO, which is, uh, what's it now? Um, Ordo Templi Orientis, which is a higher version of magic. Um, but I found no answers in that. I found no answers in the spiritual. The, the wordings that we use were too ambiguous. So I started to get very depressed and very almost suicidal, one of these typical teenage suicide people. So I went away, I ran away, and I ended up in as far away from Tasmania as you could get, which was Darwin. And I lived in the jungle in Darwin, and I just went inwards. Um, I had a few realizations at that point. I realized um, the human condition. Um, I started asking questions. I, I spoke to a few indigenous Australian indigenous people while I was up there, and I got a few. That was pro perhaps I'm I'm a bit jumpy. I'm sorry, but. Um, the first time ever I talked to an indigenous Aboriginal person and for the first time ever my paradigm had been shifted by a different way of thinking. And that was the next thing that set me on what I would call the true path. I have to point out there though that there is no such thing as a path, it cannot possibly occur. The only thing that is real, the only thing that exists is now. Anything either side of now is either memory or assumption. So given that the only thing that exists is now, where the hell can a path take you? Not possible. There is not a path. So that saved 20 years of my life because it wasn't in searching. At that point, I thought to myself, reason and logic, what schools, what religions in the world consistently, constantly produce enlightened, self-mastered people? Uh, and when you look into that question, it's very few, very, very few. Very few religions will do it, except for the couple that actually have a back door for mystics who can move beyond the religious mentality. I don't say that derogatively. Um, so I looked, um, you know, Christianity, do they produce enlightened people on a, con on a constant basis? No, they don't. Does any other religion? Not really. Buddhism does, but Buddhism isn't really a religion. And until. I don't like talking about religion, Oliver. Let's go past that bit. So <laughs> maybe in a later question. <laughs> okay. Let me know if I'm getting off track here. So that's that's where it all was. That's where it all happened. I basically got down to the very, very few basic facts. You are not your thoughts. You are what is aware of your thoughts. You are. A fact, a fact is a fact whether you believe it or not. So how much of the information in my head are beliefs? Whenever you hear anything, whenever people talk to you, you're making up the meaning in your own head. All of these things pointed towards a horrible life. So logical questions, I get back to it. I start to ask who produces enlightened people. Eventually, it got down to you go to Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism, which isn't really a religion. It can be if you want it to be. It can be a following if you want to take it that way. If you're just one of the masses that is happy knowing that there's a spiritual person in your life or a spiritual place to be once a week, and that's fine. But should you ever realize that the answers are deep, deep within you and there is no other authority, and if you wish to be a free mind and a free spirit, you can't follow anything. So to follow a guru negates freedom of mind. To follow a spiritual leader negates freedom of your own spirit. To look and follow to look for anything means you are looking for an authority, which implies you are not an authority. And all of these things shaped my plan as to how I was going to go about this. But ah. Uh, I think that was an answer. Okay, show me. Maybe just go briefly into your experiences in the Himalayas and in China. Just um, what what happened there? How many? How much time did you spend there? And uh, maybe some. What were the key insights you gained there? 
Oh, the key insight, the main key insight that was given to me in the Himalayas after everything I'd learned, there's a lot of occultism in the Himalayas, there's a lot of superstition, but there's a lot of enlightened people as well. So you have three levels of the mind all evolving at the same time. It's a wonderful place to, to be able to observe the different levels of humanity. In the Western world, I will get back to your question. <laughs> The Western world, we tend to congregate with people who, uh, with like-minded people. You go to a party very quickly, all of the uh, barbecue people will be in the back garden, all of the people that like to talk about mechanics will be over in the shed, and we congregate with people. Um, in the Himalayas, it's not like that. In India, it's not like that. In India, you can be sitting in a room with people that believe there's a God um for your shoes you know but the god birkenstock is um but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what religion you are it, it makes you happy so and that's the same as tibet it's not really that it's not really like that in china but it is in tibet so you learn a lot a lot of traditions a lot of occult things you learn a lot about survival spiritual survival after saying that, there's two main things that I learned. One of the things I learned during my, what's called your funeral training, I guess, and that is you have to do a year as a monk uh, cutting, there's no nice way of saying this, you cut people up and you feed them to the vultures, basically, or the condors. And it's a funeral set up. This is high in the Himalayas. This is when you're too far away from the rivers and such down below. It's a very honourable thing. So the, the people, after they've died, you cut them up piece by piece, and each piece is ritually offered to the hierarchy of the, the condors. Now, before you do that, you have to sit with the dead person for three days upon their death, and you start to read from what's called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Now, to Without going into the Book of the Dead, it's all the, the it's all based on when you die, it can take anything from three days to fourteen days to fully heal yourself away from the body, leech your way out of the body. As you know, every cell on your body is an individual life, and when it's over, the individual cell will fall off and another one will be replaced. My point is this: the life has to leave all of these cells before you're actually really dead. You'll, you have to slowly peel away from your liver, you have to peel away from your kidneys, etc. I could go into this forever, but basically the ritual is this. You sit down and you talk to the person and you're basically saying in their language, you may be confused right now, but you don't have to be. You've died. Your family is happy. Their family is healthy. You know me. I'm the monk that you've always come and talked to up in the monasteries uh, my name is such and such um you've been dead for a day now and you may be seeing lots of yellow moving into green don't worry about that that just means that your consciousness is peeling away from your liver and you talk them through it and you just hold their hand and you be with them for the first three days and then it goes on from there that taught me a lot the implications of that taught me a lot the other thing was change. I was talking with one of my masters at the time and um, I asked why, why so much on change? Why is it such a, a large Buddhist fundamental teaching? Uh, and what do you mean by change? And all he said was um, every human you can see up there right now will be dead in 100 years and replaced by another bunch of people. Change is the only certainty in life. There is no such thing as permanence. To which I responded, but doesn't that mean we're in a permanent state of change? Um, and what I took from that was, and what I saw in other people was, 
one of the main miseries in life is people are constantly striving for a permanent relationship, a permanent wife, a permanent husband, a permanent job, a permanent place to live, permanent happiness in a cosmos where change is the only certainty. And that creates misery in a lot of people, just that one thing alone. The other thing you can get from that is that when life is so low, when life is so bad for you, given that cha change is the only certainty, and if you are as low as you can go, when life changes again, and that will be very soon, it's gonna, you're going to go upwards. Life will get better because it can't get any worse. Um, knowing that always gives you hope. Always. There's always hope at the end of the tunnel. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel just by knowing these little things. It's not truth that sets you free. It's the implications of truth. Many people will say to you, I know change is the only certainty in life, but it doesn't help me. I, I'm still in misery. It doesn't help anything. It's not that you know that truth. It's the implications of that truth that makes life easier. Most truth is like that. Boy, did I get off track there. But that's what I got from Tibet. That was at 15. I arrived at 14. I ran away from home very quickly. I came back once, went back to school, hated that, left again. And that became my, my pattern. So occasionally I would go overseas. I would come back, earn some money, go back overseas, come back, earn a little bit more money. I rarely used a, um, a passport back then. It was very easy to just get on a fishing boat in the northern Australia, part of northern Australia, and um, for a little bit of cash or services or whatever, you, you could get a trip over and the rest yeah. is on foot. It's very easy to do. So that's how that happened. Um, that was it, really. And we were there until, no, I was there from 1975 till 1988. Um, or was it 85? I'm losing dates now. And then there was, um, I went to what's called Chokhong um, Temple, which is the main temple in Lhasa in Tibet. I'd gone there for a, a month's meeting. And unfortunately, at the time that I was there, the um, Chinese army attacked our, our temple and started killing us and hanging people and throwing monks off the roof. Um, my little group, there was 12 of us, but only three of us lived and survived that. Fortunately, one of the ones of us that survived was my master. And um, after I'd convalesced, we, those of us that were left were tortured for a little while, but we, we got pulled out of that by, um, by our embassy people, luckily. Thank you very much if you're out there. Um, so I, I started to convalesce and my teacher, my master, spoke to me and said, you know, all of the work that you've done with your mind will be totally ruined if you are holding any revenge or fearful thoughts of the Chinese. The Chinaman that stabbed me, I got bayoneted, it got scars up through here, that was a bayonet um, from a Chinese soldier at the time. and. The horror in his eyes of what he was doing told me everything. It wasn't his fault. He would have probably been shot by his sergeant if he didn't carry out his own orders. So we had a bit of a scuffle and I got shot a few times and the bayonet was released and that was the end of that. So my master was worried that I was going to hold revenge from that. So I was suggested to me, it was suggested to me that I go to China and um, study there. So I joined a, uh, a monastery in China at a place called Leifa Mountain, which is in the Hunan province, I think west of Beijing. And I studied there for five years and actually forgot what happened in Tibet. So, you yeah. know, and I learned a lot. And that's where the Qigong and the Kung Fu came into it all. So spiritually, mentally, psychologically, blossomed and grew in Tibet, strengthened all of that and honed it all in and learned about people and how to express this thing to people in China and then came back to Australia and um, 
ever since then it's all been about um, alleviating misery in people which is really easy this is why i enjoy it because i think i'm lazy <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer that one? You did. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's move on to a very particular topic, which is the one how I got in contact with you, and that's telekinesis. Um, so on your YouTube channel, you have several pretty amazing telekinesis videos. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you develop these skills and for how many years did you have to train for them? Goodness me. Telekinetic skills is a natural consequence, a natural consequence of engaging the world from the correct, the correct mind. There is a lower mind and there is a higher mind. The lower mind is made up of your thought process. When you are born, you have a pristine, clean mind, pure awareness, no thoughts, just pure awareness, and a pristine, clean state of the art body, a little baby. As a baby, as a young child, most people actually have enlightened experiences. They're able to move things. Lots of uh, most children have had experiences that they can't explain as an adult. I digress, but you'll see why in a moment. So a baby is born, pristine, clean mind, state-of-the-art mind, pristine, clean body, state-of-the-art body. And then over the next five years, we start to fill that little mind with opinions and judgments and labels and names and things that don't exist and ridiculous belief systems. And that grows inside the baby's head exponentially and fills the brain. Now, those thoughts think they are that baby and that baby thinks it is those thoughts. Now, that's what we call the ego, I guess. That's the lower mind. It's made of thoughts. If you take one of those thoughts and break it in half, it doesn't know you're in there looking at it. It's not alive. It has no wisdom of its own. The higher mind has to put thoughts in the correct order for it to be wise and for it to be wisdom. But of course, it doesn't allow it to do that because the higher mind as an, as an identity has atrophied beyond self-recognition, and this is the human condition. Now, you can't think of something you don't already know. You have to know something before you can turn it into a thought. For instance, if I say to you a matchbox, you have to already know what a matchbox is before you can turn it into a picture. As far as your brain's concerned now, you just created a matchbox. Now, if you sit there staring at a glass and you are thinking, I want that glass to move, I want that glass to move, two things are happening. The fact that you are identifying with the thoughts and identifying with yourself as a separate entity to the rest of the cosmos, you will never ever move the glass because you are implying that you are over here trying to move something that is over there. When you get rid of that thought process, you are the glass, you are the moving, and you are the mind, and you are the mover all at once. There's no separation by thought. It is your thought process that separates you from the actual thing you're trying to do. Let's back up a little bit. If you start to visualize, say you want to move a glass or a bell or whatever, if you visualize you moving the bell, as far as your brain is concerned, you've already done it, but it's happened inside your head. Your brain believes that the picture you just created is the movement that you required, and that's where it stops. Therefore, it will never happen outside. But your thought processes that separate you from these things. The moment you are the bell, the moment you are the glass and the, the observer and the observed, the moment those two things unite by getting rid of separative thoughts, moving the glass is a matter of moving your finger. You do it every day. When you move your finger, you don't think. You do this all day long. Um, and why? How are you doing that? 
is telekinetic. If you think about it, you are a spiritual being inside a physical body. How are you doing this? How do you do that? If you look at it in higher martial arts, and this, this is a piece that I got from uh, China. If you want to move your arm, you ask your normal average person how that happens. They go, oh, I just send an electrical impulse down my arm and my muscles twitch and you get the mechanics going. But then you have to think, okay, where did the impetus, who made the command to send that electrical impulse? Me. Who's me? All right, let, let's work that one out. If you negate everything you are aware of, you arrive at awareness. You watch in thought watching in, in your meditation, you will see an angry thought go by and that will be followed by an angry emotion, like a wake following a boat. Sad thought, sad emotion, etc., etc. If you negate all these things you're aware of, you arrive at awareness. You can't go further back than that because that's what you are. You are watching. And this brings us to the third eye, which we can talk about if you want to later on and what it is. So to move something telekinetically has nothing to do with developing skills. There is no tele telekinetic skill to be developed. It's immediate. The moment you start to engage the world from the higher mind, all of these so-called paranormal experiences and effects are a natural consequence of the real mind, that mind that is in all things. Let me, let's look at it this way very quickly. Every leaf on every tree has enough awareness in it to follow the sun across the sky. We learned that at school. Every blade of grass can follow the sun only because it has awareness of where the sun is. It has awareness in it. It's not the same awareness as yours or mine. It's the same one. Share the same mind in all things. And the problem is, if I think I am GM talking to Oliver, that separates us straight away. And physiologically, it's impossible for me to read your mind or move you because it's just not physiologically possible. However, if I fully am aware and I fully identify with all life and I already am you and I'm already in there, same awareness, then ESP makes sense. I'm not transmitting from one point to another. I'm just thinking in different coordinates. That's all. You see what I mean? So it's not a matter of you moving something. It's a matter of you chopping out this thought process that's separating from you and implying that you, you are a separate being to this thing. It's these implications that stop us from doing these things. You stop these implications that separate us from the rest of life and there is no more paranormal. It, it's all normal. <laughs> How do we, do, shall I keep going? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yes, yeah. Okay. The third eye. I mentioned before that these eyes can only see what blocks light. Light has to hit something, bounce off it, and go into your eyes, and you see it. And that's all. Now, when you visualize something in your head, and let's face it, inside here is pitch black. There's no light in there. There's no light bulb that you can turn on. There's no mysterious light that goes on that you'd see it coming out of the ears if there was and the eyes. So it's pitch black in there. So how the hell are you seeing those pictures? Mm -hmm. You've got to find out. That's the third eye. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, Very, very few people actually experience the outside world. We live our entire lives inside, inside our heads. Once you can get this third eye to be your dominant visual apparatus, you start to see it starts to see outwards as well, and then you start to see things outwardly that these eyes can't see. And let's face it, this, this insight that you have in your head, it sees thoughts, it sees pictures, it sees imaginings. Uh, if you can visualize the sun bright enough, you'll squint, and yet you're seeing it inside your head. That's your third eye. The Egyptians call it the eye of Horus. The um, 
anyway. Every culture that has produced um, a bona fide mystic. will have a, some representation of this inner sight, this inner eye, the all-seeing, the all-knowing, et cetera, et cetera. Horus, no, not Horus, sorry, that was the wrong one. <laughs> I'm going off track now because I think I've answered that question. So that's yep. the third eye. That's the eye that you use to see reality with. These ones don't work. These ones will just stop you from bumping into trees and things in this particular realm. That's all they're going to do for you. Um, you are not what you are aware of. You are awareness. The awareness is also the third eye. It's the same thing. Um, and at that point, you are the seen, the seeing, and the seer all at once. And this, in that, is how telekinesis works. You want to go into quantum physics? The probably last not, probably not today. <laughs> <laughs> in quantum physics, anyway, real, very, very quickly, quantum physics, look into quantum entanglement, and that will explain physiologically, scientifically, what I'm telling you now. You have quantum entanglement with all other forms of life. You know that, and therefore you're already in there. And this is how we can attract things, and this is how we can read each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay. Next question. Now, what I got from your last answer is that the main limiting factor, if you can't do telekinesis, is that you are not connected to the object that your own thought processes are hindering you to actually do it because you're not uh, at that stage to be connected to the object. Uh, the question I would have is, have you noticed an effect uh, of, for example, people who are looking while you are doing telekinesis? Let's say you have a group of 10 scientists who all believe it's all bogus and it's a trick and it won't work. And they, you have to perform under that situation. Is there an effect of the situation on how well you can perform? No. No, if you can do it, you can do it. If you can't, you can't. It would be, if there is any hindrance at all, it would be no different to someone being able to take a pee while someone else is watching. <laughs> that doesn't bother me. <laughs> um, no. It depends what you're using. The, the, you know, peak K isn't just, there's several ways you can do it. One is chi movement, which is a force. The other one is uh, based on what I was telling you about. Um, it's just a matter of reconnecting with the rest of the world and stop having thought processes that imply that you are a separate, fragmented entity. While ever you believe, while ever there is an inkling or a concept that you are a fragmented individual entity from the rest of it, you have no hope on this planet of connecting or with anything or moving anything other than by touching it physiologically. It's, um, it's a pretty bad situation, actually, but the world's growing. Consciousness is growing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident <laughs> in life. life not silly. And you also have to understand that as a mystic, when you say the word I or me, you are speaking for the rest of the cosmos. If you're not, you're lying. When you say I or me, you're not including the rest of the cosmos in that, you're lying or you're deluded. Um, whenever you say I, and the entire picture around your eye, the definition of your eye is this self-centered individual creature that has no connection to anything else other than by words and sounds. You're living a horrible delusion. It'll keep you happy. But there comes a time in older age in everyone's life where these questions start to crop up. And you don't want to be 60, 70, 80 years old laying on your deathbed. Let me back up a little bit. Make that, this might be a little dark. We'll see what happens. Two things are going to happen on your deathbed. You're either going to sit there with a smile on your face and be able to say to the people around you, that was a fantastic life. I understood everything about life. I know what life's about. 
and I know what I'm about to do and what's going to happen next, and I am content. Or you're going to lay there and think to yourself, what the hell was that all about? That was painful. I did not like one little bit of that. What the hell? And you're going to die in confusion and fear and all the rest of it. For me, that's not an option. Um, one of the temples that I lived in in the Himalayas, we used to on a regular basis, twice a week, by that I mean, we would die. We would literally flatline, stop your heart. And there's a few masters that are very, very good at kickstarting you again. <laughs> so they would stand there and they would talk to you. The reason you start doing that is so that they can show you what is happening to the people you are taking through the funeral situation. So you'll die. They stop your heart. You basically use the vagus nerve that runs down the choroidal artery. You hit the vagus nerve and um, you fall unconscious. Your heart stops. Uh, in the beginning, you can do it for two or three minutes and then you learn to hyperventilate and that will get you another three or four minutes in there and it all it, it almost becomes like um deep diving for people it, it's how much oxygen you have in your system depends on how long you can be in there so you do lots of qigong and you saturate your body with oxygen and then you flatline and that can give you five up to ten minutes in a dead situation you've got to keep in mind also in the himalayas it's very cold and that helps a lot when um when the teacher perceives that you're going a little blue you know, have a look at your eyes and everything else and they'll kick start you and that's your session so of course after a little while of doing that death means nothing to you it's, it's like going to the shop to get a bottle of milk the main thing two things you learn from that is that it's totally possible and it gets rid of the fear of death oh they're the two things <laughs> Once you get rid of the fear of death, you become a very brave person, kind of. Could I go into that just a little bit? Sure, yeah. Right, group. The lower mind, as I mentioned before, has no wisdom of its own. And you have to be using your inner sight as well as your outer sight for wisdom. The lower mind is what thinks, the higher mind gives it its wisdom. When you are totally going off on the lower mind and that's all you use to engage the world with, you start to miss out on wisdom. You stop injecting wisdom into your thought processes. I'll give you a very small example, very trivial example. Courage. This is why I brought it up because I mentioned courage before. People come to me and ask me to get rid of their fear so they can be courageous. And what I have to point out is, if you're not scared of something, you can't be courageous. Courage, the very definition of courage is doing something that scares the hell out of you, but you do it anyway. That's courage. It doesn't take courage to go to war. Well, if you enjoy war, it doesn't take courage. It takes stupidity. When you hear someone say these things, it's very obvious that people generally don't. They don't think of things like this. Another one is willpower. Everyone wants more willpower so they can be more courageous. How do you develop willpower? You can't develop willpower by doing things that you enjoy doing. That doesn't take willpower. It takes willpower to do things you don't want to do. And in that is a tip on how you choose your discipline. If you are thinking about spiritual discipline or anything of that nature, discipline in your mind, disciplining yourself, your spirit, you can't discipline spirit. It's the spirit that's actually doing the disciplining in the first place. But the point is this, if you choose a discipline that you thoroughly enjoy, you're not going to develop willpower. You have to develop your willpower on something that you don't want to do because it's hard and you don't like it. How are you going to get that done if you don't like it and you don't want to you've got to summon up your willpower and that's how you do that little things like that make the difference between failure and success in these these realms 
understanding these things. Otherwise, you could spend a hundred years trying to develop courage, not realizing that you're just going in the wrong direction. You're doing everything that you enjoy doing. Anyway, I think I got off track quite a lot, but I wanted to put that in. I wanted to show you the difference between thinking without the higher mind's involvement and how the higher mind injects the wisdom into your thought. So the difference between a wise person enjoying their life and a, a person who's not enjoying their life, an unwise person, is the wiser person is engaging their higher mind. Uh, that means they're sitting back, they're watching their thoughts, they're watching how they respond to people, and they allow for it. Knowing yourself doesn't mean you're going to find this wonderful angelic self. You're not. Knowing yourself means you can sit back and say to yourself, okay, this particular body I'm in at the moment, it, it has a tendency to be lazy. It doesn't like certain things. You learn all about the monkey that you're in, and you allow for that. If it is lazy and if it doesn't like to do things, then yes, you're going to have to learn some discipline. Um, so once again, just being clear on the human condition, be clear on how we put thoughts together, being clear as to where we can access our own wisdom means you will move a lot faster. Life will become much more better for you. There will be, it will answer all questions. All of a sudden, simplicity of life will just appear in front of you like a shadow when you turn a light on in a room your shadow goes bang it's there immediately and that's what happens the moment you engage life from the higher mind so telekinesis teleportation um, all of this are all natural consequences of the higher mind the only practice is to crystallize the higher mind by that i mean constantly engage the world from that when you do you will find that life is like this you will be here as awareness your thoughts will be over here somewhere the outside world will be over there somewhere and you'll see the connection between you and it at the moment everyone is caught in thought processes and that's where life and death ends for them it's over it's a great shame I'm very reluctant to say this, but it, religion is a major instigator in the way we think these days. It's taken us away from our own power, taken us away from our own spirit. It has atrophied our own authority over our own lives. People are too scared to take responsibility now because et cetera, et cetera. I won't go down that road. Next question, Oliver. Okay, oh, oh. coming back to <laughs> telekinesis, um, we were talking yesterday briefly in advance and you mentioned that you're planning to go to Denmark this year to have some scientific experiments done at a university. Can you just give us a very brief uh, idea of what's, what's, what's planned there? Oh, this will be very brief because I don't have a clue. It was about three days ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have an apprentice in Sweden. I have them all over the world. Um, and he's quite a good friend of the um, one or more of the chaps that are on the committee of the, I think, um, the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel, the Pulitzer. I forgot which one they do. But anyway, they're scientists. So, and they're quite uh, high up there. They're, they're scientists who can um, pull strings, scientists who have access to some of the best equipment. Um, and I've consented to go over there and um, be experimented on. <laughs> Let's see what happens. That's all I can tell you. I don't even know the name of the chap. It was mentioned to me, but it, it didn't go in, and I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, it's a very, very new situation that's come up. I will certainly keep you informed. Absolutely. On that note, actually, I noticed that you've had a, a talk to um, a Dean Radin. Is that correct? At some uh, point in the past. Well, I did. I, I did uh, the translation of an interview, and I also had some conversations with him. Yes, that's that's correct. Yes, he's done some extremely interesting experiments that I've looked at. I would like to meet him sometime. He's a scientist that uh, I think is very brave. 
Um, he hasn't given up on what he believes. He hasn't given up on what he knows. Um, I imagine he would be in the same position that Darwin was many, many years ago when he had to try and convince the religious world of what he'd found. So if you're out there anyway, Dane, you've got my support, old boy. Go for it. You'll come through. So that's that. I'm sorry, I can't give you any more information, but you will that's... be the first to know. Okay, that's fine. So uh, the next questions, I'm not really sure. I mean, based on what you already said, a lot of what I try to get here is kind of higher. You would explain it as higher mind actions. I would maybe you can try to explain some things from a lower mind perspective about what you do. That's maybe that as a background for the next question. So, uh, what, <laughs> goes, what, what goes on in your mind when you move an object through telekinesis? Are you visualizing anything at that moment? So maybe you can explain that. What's exactly going on as far as you can explain it from a lower mind perspective? <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. Um, one moment. A lower mind perspective. I need to be. I need to clarify the question. So you do you mean? Um, do, do you want me to explain it through what I think? I would have to explain it through quantum physics because that's what's happening. Okay, explain it whatever way works for you. It's just that I mean, if you just say, "Well, it's all higher mind stuff," and I can't really explain, then that doesn't help. So I, I just try to get an answer from you in a way that a layman will understand what's going on in your head as you move an object. That's that's the main question. Okay. I can give you an example of where it happens every day. Zen archery. Zen archery only occurs when there isn't a single thought in the mind. And you have to realize that when you stop thoughts, the moment they stop, even if only for two, three seconds, and I mean stopped, no thoughts at all, two or three seconds means that you have no concept that you are there. You have no concept that you are there separate from the object, you have no concept of the object, you don't even have these words in your head. At that moment, anything and everything is possible. If anything happens in my head, it's only for a moment, and that is turn off the lower mind for a moment. Thoughts. Now, what I'm going at here, you may even be able to relate to this yourself. When you're a kid, you get a handful of stones and you want to throw the stone at a target and you look at the target, you focus on the target, and every single time you throw a stone, you miss. But you'll notice that when you're looking away from the target and you're just throwing your stone up in the air and catching it, and then the moment that you're not thinking about anything in particular, you look at the target and you throw the rock, you'll hit it every single time. You, m most sports people can tell you that this happens a lot. And it's only at that moment when they're not thinking. If you watch an American baseball player, he's looking at the, the batsman, he's doing his little movements and picking his nose and doing all the signs that they do to each other. But when he's ready to throw, he looks away. And then he'll look and throw, and he hits the mark every single time. That's Zen archery. That's how. That's Zen in baseball. That's how it works, and that's how you move things. It is only at the moment when you don't have any thoughts that are implying that you are separate from the thing you are going to move. And that's what does it. It's not, there's no special thought process. There's no special mantra that you, you chant. That, that's all silly stuff. That's not how it works. It's all quite real outside of the mind. It's all... Um, it's all connected. It's not as hard as you think it's going to be. The moment you work on yourself, the moment you go inwards, the moment you put your thought process back in its place, the moment you step out of your head and move things. You like that? Yeah. Now. <laughs> 
Okay, next question. <laughs> um, is it a mentally draining activity in any way for you to perform telekinesis or could you do it for like 10 minutes straight and it wouldn't really bother you? If you're using chi, yes, it will drain you. You, will, you, will, you can deplete your chi. When your chi is depleted, you are dead. So you really know how you really have to know how to manage your chi. So yes, in that respect. If you are using mind, no, it, you, you go on and on and on forever. You know, you doing this, you can do this all day long. You use your feet all day long. And I'm, I'm talking in the respect that when you move your body, you are creating telekinesis. There's no two ways about it. You, you are um, you are sending a spiritual message to through via your brain. And from that, you are prompting, instigating movement in a material body. And how do you do this? You do that magically in another way as well. Eat an apple. And in 15 minutes, that apple is now Oliver. That's magic, you know. So I think I answered your question. <laughs> okay, you did, sure. Uh, next one. Um, in some of your videos, we see that you, for example, cut the palm of your hand with a knife and then instantly heal it again. Uh, in others, you set a piece of paper on fire, which you hold in your hand. And in others, uh, you hold your hand above a candle for like 90 seconds and nothing really happens. Does any of this cause you physical pain as you do it? And has it any kind of negative after effect? <laughs> negative after effect? Yeah, death. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it is dangerous um, when you see what I do on on the YouTube channel. There are a few things you don't see. For instance, I do have to spend, for some of what I do, I have to spend 10, 15 minutes calming myself, getting into the right mind space. But other things, it's purely a matter of how you're looking at it. If, give me a sec here, I'm trying to formulate this in the correct way. Oopsie daisy. If you're a sane person and you love yourself and you love life, you're not going to hurt yourself. You're not going to stab yourself. You're not going to hurt yourself. It's just not in us to hurt ourselves as a species, unless you're suicidal, in which case that's insanity and it's not normal. So we don't do that. Now, if you're going to scratch your ear, you don't push so hard that it bloody hurts. You don't do that. You very gentle with it. It's not in our nature. Now, once it is in your mind that you are the flame, you are the hand, you are the instigator of the flame in the hand, that flame won't hurt you because life doesn't harm itself. So you're basically using a fundamental principle of life and love, not, not the fluffy, fuzzy love that people commonly think about. But real love, love whereby life will not end, life does not end, and life will not harm itself. When it comes to life and death and things being destroyed and all the rest of it, that's just uh, what the Indians call Kali. Um, one of the symbols of Kali, one of the Indian gods, is the great demonic mother, and she has children's skulls around her neck. What it's representing is this, and I'll put this into the best terms that I can that is not mystical. If you were to sit on the moon and you look back at our Earth and you time lapse the Earth so that <clears throat> every day is a second time lapse, this is just moving quite fast. As you watch all the trees come and go and the people come and go and the whales and the insects and the birds and all life comes and goes, comes and goes. What's happening there? This planet, this, this let's call it the mother at the moment, produces a billion children and then eats them and then produces another billion and then eats them. That's what life is. That's what it's doing. Constantly eats itself in order to create more of itself. 
that's what we call life and death but that it's actually just the breathing of life with the breathing of nature on this planet so there's an answer in that to people who want to know what to eat if you want to follow nature you eat everything nothing in particular but nothing or everything in general go with your taste the fact is if you want to follow nature nature is omni omnivorous it eats itself constantly if you go and sit under a tree and die it will eat you you know that <laughs> but that's sad i forgot what your question was i'm sorry i, I get very excited with the, the things that i see well, it's it's okay. We, we can actually move on to the next one, which is again in the same area, and um, it's about the protection you use, for example, from the flame. Is that something? I mean, you already explained it partly that kind of when you are connected with it, then it can't really hurt you. But is it just that mindset, or is there also, for example, as you said, some chi involved that you make some chi protection layer below your hand, and then the the flame can't hurt you? Can you speak a little more about that part when you put the hand above the flame? Sure. In martial arts, you will learn that every time you exhale with a jolt from your dantian, and for those who are listening to this that don't know what that is, that's a little space about an inch and a half below your navel where you store your chi energy. And there are very specific uh, exercises to store your chi there. Now, excuse me, in martial arts, someone can hit you in the stomach or anywhere on your body and you'll go ow and you'll feel it but when they do hit you and you go <clears throat> at that moment you can't feel it now what happens is whenever you contract and go <clears throat> your chi comes to the surface all over your body boom it's it you can't stop that that's just natural in everyone once again it's not something that you develop over thousands of years. You don't have to spend months and months. You just have to stop looking for the authority in books of how to do these things. Stop looking for authority in other people and just do it. It's in there. It can be done. Anyone, everyone can do this, but you have to let go of your thought processes. If I was to consciously try and create a chi shield, that would be implying to me that I'm trying to protect myself from something other and it would not work. So just as a backup, and to me, the whole chi shield, putting your hand over a flame is just child's play with this sort of thing, honestly. This isn't just me. Um, everyone in the monasteries that I was with could do these things. They're out there right now, you know, they're either dead or they're teaching their families or they're teaching villages and or they're using who knows what they use their skills for, but it's always for good. Um, and it's not always for good because they've trained to be nice people, it's for good because they, they're coming from the higher mind and in the higher mind it's just you don't have any plans, you just do stuff. Life lives through you. And you have to be selfless enough to allow life to live through you. And when you do that, suddenly you know everything. The, again, once again, the major key is what in what I said quite a while ago now, in that you are not what you think. You, I'm going to drop that piece of conversation right there because <laughs> okay. that off in a long direction um the chi chi follows mind chi follows the higher mind the lower mind cannot control chi it will not do that i don't know how much you know about qigong and chi exercises but there is a thing called the microcosmic orbit where you breathe and you circulate the chi up your spine over the top of your head down the back of your throat into your dantian it's called the microcosmic orbit for obvious reasons orbiting your body with it um that's That's an exercise in chi following your mind. So in your mind, 
you move the chi. You don't say it. You can't. As soon as you say it, you've taken your attention off the chi. The chi will follow your mind like a wake follows a boat, like an emotion will follow a thought. So by moving your mind around your body, you're doing a few things. You are developing the ability to stay leached out of your thought processes for a while. Let me go into a whole other direction with this conversation. If you were going to go into space, you have to put on a space suit. And in that space suit, just before you, there would be a little panel processor telling you what the temperature is outside, how much radiation is hitting your suit at the moment, how much oxygen you have left, uh, the temperature of the environment inside your suit. You need all of these things to know what's going on in the outside world so that you can protect yourself inside your suit and work in that environment without dying. If you're going to go in deep sea diving, you would do the same thing. You have to have a special suit to survive in that environment. And there, once again, you would have instruments constantly telling you what's going on between you and the outside world, how deep you are, how much oxygen you have left, etc., etc. We are in one of those suits now. It's, we, it's, it's an earth suit. And somewhere between you and the outside world, there's a processor and it's telling you about all the information that's coming through with light, with sounds, with temperature and everything else. Now, at some point in our evolution, we have made that processor, our, which is our thought process, we have started to identify with that as being us. And that is the problem with everything, not just telekinetically, not just ESP-wise, but with the entire world with what we do to each other, with what we do to the planet, with what we do to animals, just what we do. It's all insanity, it, you know. Don't get me wrong, there's some lovely, life is fantastic. But in the human world, you know what I'm talking about. So it's all due to the fact that of wrong identity. Um, our thoughts, as I said before, if you take a thought and break it in half, it doesn't know you're there looking at it. It's a dead thing. Now, when you are, when you think you are your thoughts and you're not injecting, you, you are, you're not exercising yourself as a higher mind, you're pretty much atrophied. The dominating force in your head at that point is your thought process. And the higher mind, the awareness of these things, is way down here somewhere. I mean, right now, I know what it is I wish to convey. I watch my brain turn it into thoughts. I watch my monkey splurt it out into vibrations, grunts, basically. Mutually acceptable grunts is what language is. And then I watch your response, and you do the same thing. The only difference is I'm watching all of that, and you're not. Not because I'm special and you're not. It's just that I... I have decided with my entire life from that high viewpoint, I, I don't enjoy using thoughts very much if I can help it. But in the world, if you want to engage with other people, of course you have to. Now, these thoughts left on their own, like a kaleidoscope, as you turn it with emotions and responses to the outside world, these thoughts all connect up in all sorts of stupid ways and they come up with all silly ideas of how we must have got here and how life must have started. And if it's conniving enough and if they can convince other people of these ridiculous ideas they've put together, then they've got a religion going. That's the lower mind. The higher mind watches it do these things and reels back in horror. You know, when you're at school, you start hearing religious concepts and Every child in the world goes, no, that can't be right. That's not rational. But by the time you're 12, 13, you've been convinced, and that's the end of that. But this is what happens. If you're a raindrop floating across the sky, floating over the ocean, you would look down on the ocean, and deep inside yourself, you would know that you came from there somehow. That is your God. That is what you came from. 
but you have no idea of the processes of evaporation and rain and preci precipitation and creeks and rivers and everything that brings you back to that ocean and then it all starts again you have no idea of that that is so beyond your little raindrop abilities so you look down on this ocean and you come up with all sorts of contrivances as how you believe you got up here and how do you get back and if you can convince a whole bunch of other raindrops of what you've seen then you've got a cloud or a religion of course the day is going to come where it will rain and as a raindrop, you will fall and you will hit that ocean. And the moment you do, suddenly you are in every blowhole of every whale, between every scale of every fish, under the shell of every crab, wherever there's water in the ocean, you are there. And everything is now in you. And that is so different to what you thought when you were a raindrop. And that's like the human condition. It is nothing like you think and everything is in you you are not in the world the world is in you and what i'm talking about there is your mind is the cosmos and it is full of stuff that it has put together imagine for a moment if you could oliver please imagine the cosmos before there was matter before there was dust before there was stars and planets and gases nothing and let's say you are there floating in amongst that nothingness with no body, no thoughts, just pure awareness. That's all you are. How would you know you were there? You wouldn't. You have to see something first to know that you're there. And of course, there's nothing there to see. So what do you do? I'm going to say this in English, but this wouldn't be how it went down. As we all know, space is made of substance. This is mysticism. Space is, has a substance. We won't go into the Higgs boson and all the rest of it, but it has a substance, obviously. You just look at it, and this is how I figured it out, not through science books. If you look at the shape of a galaxy, the legs are twirled, the legs are all bent. If there was no substance in space, those legs would be sticking straight out as the galaxy turns because there would be no resistance on, on them bending the legs on the galaxy. You see what I mean? So there has to be. So that told me this substance in space. So space is a thing and you just happen to be that thing. Now, because it has substance, as we all know, when substances reach a critical mass, they start to light up. So there would have been a point somewhere where emptiness has been there, which is you. Your awareness, but nothing to be aware of. It's there. Mind is what the Tibetans call it. Now, in that eternity, of nothingness there would have been a point where it started to light up it wouldn't have been a center because there is no center for there to be a center there has to be a periphery to measure a center from and there isn't one so there's no center so somewhere in space it would have lit up and the rest of space would have gone something like <gasps> i am what am i i don't know i'm invisible how do i get around that I have to be able to see myself. Bang. From that need comes matter. Doesn't matter whether it's through a big bang or any other way, but that's where matter it's there. Now life can see itself. Now it has something to see and it starts exploring. Now, unless there is a periphery out there, life is going to go exploring forever in all directions because it needs to know itself. The fact that you and I are speaking now is based on that internal, eternal need to know what it is. It doesn't know, it's a baby and it's expanding. And until it explores and realizes every potentiality that it could possibly be as life, every form, then it will never have known itself fully. Now, as a mystic, that's the page that you're on. You are life seeing what it is. So when you look at someone, there's no need for opinion. There's no need for judgment. That's just another fascinating asset of life on this particular planet. At that point, with that mindset, everything is fascinating. There is no depression. There's no, what should I be doing? It's all, what am I doing now? And you watch. You watch yourself. If Oliver wants to meditate for real, 
just watch Oliver every second of the day. Watch what he does. Watch what he's saying. Watch why he says it. Watch why he is searching for whatever he's searching for. And eventually, you are developing the watcher inside you, and you've stopped looking outside for authority, because that very Oliver that is watching. In fact, you're not called Oliver. You have to watch Oliver. You don't have a name. Let me elaborate on that one. If you look out the window and look at a tree and think to yourself, outside of this little six inch box, to the rest of the cosmos, what is that called? And you won't get an answer. It's not called a tree. It's not called green. It's not called hard. It's, it's outside of the human head. It has no name. It has no meaning. It is alive and it is doing what it is doing. That is the Tao. The Tao means the way, not the way as in the way to the shop or the way to the toilet, the way as in this is the way it works. So that's the Tao. Once you have that mindset, it's obvious that you are all things. All things are in you. Nothing can possibly die. There's no such thing as death. Where the hell could you go if you are all things, if you are the cosmos? You are the mind that saturates the cosmos, where can you go and still not be within yourself? I'm not talking metaphorically either, I'm talking literally. It's this mindset and this way of seeing things that has the natural consequence of supernatural phenomena, which at that point isn't supernatural phenomena, there's no such thing. Bloody hell. <laughs> okay, that was a very good right. answer. Thank you. I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. We'll we'll move on to the next one. Um, I have one more question in the same field uh, of paranormal things, and that's the aspect of materializing and dematerializing objects. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Uh, have you experience with it? And uh, how do you, would you say, does it work? Because, I mean, matter doesn't just come from nothing, at least in the way our world seems to work. Let's put it that way. Teleportation is what you're speaking of. Um, I can't do it, not yet, but I will. Um, teleportation. <clears throat> very, very early in my occult training, I'm not an occultist now, well I am, but you have to understand that occult is, just means the hidden, hidden things. Um, you know, it would have only been I don't know, 200 years ago that a walkie-talkie would have been seen as a cult. But now that we all know about the technology, it's not. So anyway, getting back to the original, what I was going to say. I went and saw this old gentleman who was uh, extremely good at what he did. He wasn't on the path to enlightenment at all. He was a very, very serious occultist. He, he followed people like um, Israel Rigade, Alistair Crowley. And he used to study Enochian magic. Um, he was very, very good with the Keys of Solomon, which was very powerful magic, by the way, the Keys of Solomon. Anyway, he was quite old. I think he was about 72 years old. We went and visited this gentleman. He was going to do a demonstration of materializing something out of nowhere for us. This is what happened. We filled the room up. There's about 10 of us. He filled the room up with an incense smoke to the point where it was burning our eyes. We could hardly see anyone at the other end of the room. <clears throat> and we thought, OK, he's put so much smoke in here. He's lining us up for an optical illusion. This is what we thought. Real mystics don't go into these things expecting something to happen you go into these things expecting to be tricked and then when you're not tricked it's a pleasant experience so this gentleman fills a room up with smoke he had a few candles going around the place and then he started to focus his mind and what we realized much later but not at the time he was projecting a thought beyond himself into the room uh, this is something that um, 
oh gosh, what's his name? Nikolai Tesla used to do this quite often. <clears throat> but that's something else. So this gentleman, he's focused on one particular thought, one thought, one image, and then he projects that image outside of himself. And in this particular case, it was a unicorn. Now within, I guess, one and a half seconds, all the smoke in the room just went boom and solidified into the center of the room. And it was a unicorn. It was about as big as a Shetland pony. And it started to walk around the room. One woman kind of screamed and that broke the, the old gentleman's focus. And again, within a moment, within a second, this unicorn went poof, and all of a sudden it was smoke and their eyes were burning. That's how you do it. It's not really you that has been transported. It is your blueprint is projected by the mind and matter will gather around that in exactly the same way as when a higher mind starts to enter the womb of a woman matter will start to accumulate and grow around that and that's how it happens if upon death you can watch the body die and if in death you are not clinging to form and not clinging to life and all of the rest of it you will be reborn within 48 hours um, and that, that, that is what they call being free from karma, which is another discussion in itself. So the key is in that, the fact that um, mind is already all over the place, mind already saturates everything, it's everywhere. It is all things are in mind as opposed to the mind being in all things. Here's another good visual for you. If every sea sponge at the bottom of the ocean thought that the water in it was an individual little packet of water separate from everything else that is one diluted sea sponge the fact is the same ocean saturates all the sea sponges just as the same mind saturates all brains and all life so you're already over there you're already in another area it's just a matter of creating the right blueprint with the right intent and the right feel if mind, wherever mind is, life starts to coagulate, you, you can't stop it. It's just what happens. That's why the cosmos is full of life and it always will be. And that's how transportation occurs. It's a focused thing, but it's not a separative thing. If you think you want to get, if you have the thought process, Oliver wants to go over there, it's not going to happen. You need to already know that you're already over there and you just need to change the coordinates of your focus and you will be there and other people will see it most people will see it not all i need to explain that Do we have 30 seconds for an explanation sure, sure. as i said in the beginning i was uh, an occultist I, I was looking into ghosts and ghost hunting and things like this and down here in tasmania there was a situation where a car park was haunted and in the car park each night, a woman in white, of course, would walk across the car park. She had no feet. Uh, it looked like her feet had been cut off at the ankles. And then she would just bend over and disappear in the middle of the car park. I looked into this for a long, long time. And we looked into the history and all the rest of it. Very long story short, there used to be a homestead there with a courtyard. And in the middle of the courtyard was a well. And the courtyard was made up of the house it was around this well and in, in the courtyard all the bedrooms used to face inwards into the courtyard <clears throat> now the woman of the house is very depressed very upset very psychotic and she ended up killing herself one night in the full moon she walked out into the garden bent over and jumped into the well now her daughter saw this a 12 year old daughter and this horrified her, of course. Now, what happens is when someone is horrified enough, 
two things will happen. You will either split off an identity and become a multiple personality situation within yourself. Or if the mind is strong enough, you will throw the image out and just get rid of it in the same way that when you hit yourself on the finger with a hammer, you go like that and you try and shake it off. The brain does the same thing with pain that it just does not want there. So it'll throw it out. That becomes a ghost image. It's not alive. It's not a spirit. It's, it's a thought projection of this young girl. Uh, very, very close akin to poltergeist activity. So this girl's created this image. Now, the first thing to understand here is if this girl thinks on a certain frequency, the brain waves on a certain frequency, only other people that think on that same frequency will actually be able to see this thought, this thought picture, this ghost. Because in the same way that if you're trying to talk to me with a walkie-talkie, I can only hear you if my walkie-talkie is on the same frequency. Understand that. You're an engineer. I know you understand that. But that's what's going on there. Now, people today who are seeing this ghost are obviously on the same frequency as this, this girl that was thinking. Now, the fate was, over time, this house was taken down and it was bought by a shopping centre and a bitumen, um, bitumen was laid in the car park, which came up that far. And that's why you couldn't see her feet. Her feet was actually under the bitumen on the, on the ground. So it looked like her feet had been cut off. And of course, when she bent over and disappeared, she was going into the well. That's, a, that's, an, that's a, an example of how it can happen accidentally. So that's a ghost. That's not a spirit. They're very different. A ghost is not a living thing. A spirit is. What did you ask me? <laughs> well, we were starting with materialization and dematerialization of objects, teleportation. That's how we got started. Okay. Well, that, that's kind of, I think I've answered that. Yep, you did. Four questions left. Is that okay if we go through them? Oh, go for it. I'm loving it. I'm enjoying myself. Are you? Okay. Good. I, I'm having a good time. This is a great conversation. So I'm very happy. Cool. 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 I'm happy. Okay. So next one. Um, so here in the West, uh, the whole telekinesis subject is kind of dealt with uh, generally as, well, it must be a trick. It can't be real. And uh, one of the thoughts that I wanted to run by you is, is it probably the reason for it being so, the fear that if you admit that it is real, that then uh, you have to consider that your thoughts have an influence on the outside world, and that might be might be for some people fearful because they always thought, well, my, my thoughts are safe within my own head. Nobody else is ever going to know what I'm thinking. And that kind of goes out the window when you realize that with your thoughts, you can move objects. So there's this direct interaction. So do you think that's probably the reason for the fear about the whole subject, that it can't be real because then so many other things have to be real too? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's a damn good question. It's a long one. Yeah, um, I think everyone, well, I hope everyone understands uh, the, the effects that the mind has on water. Have you seen that documentary with the... Uh, Emoto, uh, the Japanese guy, Emoto with the water crystals, yes. Mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely, that alone should tell you, should give you an answer there, because we're 75% water, so every thought you have towards other people negatively is affecting your water the more you hate a person the sicker you're going to become the more aggressive you become the more sicker you're going to become it's not hurting anyone other than you unless they are close enough for you of course to start affecting that and that's just on the water level that's just on that particular case you also have to understand that um, the amount of water that is between you and i um, in the atmosphere, it gets affected by how we think. The water in the ocean, the um, as you are, are aware, water remembers it. It, uh, it, it holds on to information forever. So, if you imagine how much water there is on this planet, and how much of it has gone through warriors and people who have been tortured and all of the horrible things that people do on this planet. 
it's all recorded in the water. They've all drunk water at some point and they've all peed it out and sweated it out and it's all returned back to the ocean. And the molecules have collected all of that. And that's just on this planet. And that's not counting. And this is where I want to go with it. We have to also remember that before the water arrived on this planet, it was on other planets. Now, even now, as we speak, there are galaxies bumping into each other. There's planets bumping into each other. There's asteroids smashing planets. If this happens to a planet with an ocean that's full of life, the moment that planet explodes and the life gets strewn out into space, a lot of it's going to get snap frozen because it's 250 degrees below zero out there. So big chunks of the ocean get frozen, full of life, full of whatever that life was thinking about at the time and the history of the planet that that water was on. And that meteorite now what are they called? that comet now which is ice is going to be flying through space for god knows how many millions or billions of years then it hits another planet like ours and now we have memories from other planets from other galaxies from other life and this is how this is how the cosmos thinks when i ask you what color is your house a part of you shot across your brain within a trillionth of a second and came back and told you what color your house was that information is there it's all over your brain it comes together and creates everything that you know and in the same way water carries information across the cosmos this is how the cosmos speaks to itself it's how it's unfolding it's how it knows what's going on at any given moment anywhere within itself is through water so to answer your question yes people People are scared. People, most of this generation, perhaps not the young generation, but most of our generation have grown up, whether we believe it or not, hearing little things like, you'll go to hell. That's evil. You shouldn't be doing that. God's watching you. All of these things, it, it has a horrible effect on our psyche when you think you've been constantly watched. Um, then, of course, We've all been tarred with the same thing. If you're a witch, you're evil and you're going to get burned at the stake. If you're gay, you're evil. If you're not doing what our religion says, you're evil. And there's no two ways about it. So there's all of that. There is all of them. <laughs> there's all of that. You know what I'm getting at. And it's all yes, yes, yes to your question. It's fear, fear driven. You know, we had the Stone Age. We had the Ice Age, and this is the Fear Age, and it's also the age of incorrect PC. Political connect. Honestly, I think political correctness is going to be the next atomic bomb that hits this planet. It's, um, people are terrified to speak the truth because of political correctness. It's almost become illegal to speak your mind because of political correctness. Very, very cleverly done. Um, suppression, all of that creates the fear for anyone to step out of boundaries and just go with the status quo. It's what they want to do. People don't want to break out of the box. They would like to, but they're too scared. And this is why I, um, one of the reasons I admired Dean Radin uh, he steps out of the box he knows he wouldn't have stayed out of the box he wouldn't still be doing what he does he didn't believe 100 not even belief i don't think belief comes into it with science i don't subscribe to beliefs um, a fact is a fact whether you believe it or not a belief can't exist outside of the human head so why the hell would we base our lives on that stuff it's it's insanity <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Did I answer you? Um, the next question I have is related to, to media and some of the shows we see. There's a lot of um, shows where we have uh, heroes with paranormal abilities, and I'm often thinking, is that maybe a preparation for society to consider that more 
something more normal. And I would just be interested in how you see the acceptance of these kind of abilities in the in the future. Oh, gosh, you've had some, you've got some good questions, Ollie. I love it. Everyone, there are more and more people. X uh, X Men. Uh, have you seen the X Men? Sure. Very good. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that actually will happen, but not not Hollywood style, of course. There are more and more people. I'm sure you've heard of the Ice Man at the moment. Uh, not the assassin from America, but the guy up in I think Sweden or Switzerland, and he swims in the ice, and uh, he doesn't feel the cold. And uh, he has certain meditations. He does workshops on meditations whereby people can get rid of their own viruses and infections with a certain breathing techniques, which is what I will be doing after this to get rid of my virus. Um, there is a very, very obvious decline in religion. Um, there are other things that are going to try and take over that void in people's lives. That's the only danger that would concern me in the future. People, it's, it's, people are lazy and it's too easy to follow. Um, and as I said, to follow anything negates freedom of mind and spirit. That all of that situation is going to be a problem. However, and we're going to see more of it. We're going to see a lot more, um, behind the scenes suppression ways of just you know distracting us from reality however religion which has a massive part to do with the way we think today because it was our original education let's educate the people so they can think like we want them to think etc i'm not blaming anyone i'm not saying that this is purposefully done this is just the way people evolve that's the kind of monkey we are the way we think but you know we are also the kind of creature that can change ourselves and change the way we are anyway i'm going off into a different direction there so yes you can't fix a problem with the same mind that created the problem in the first place one of my heroes said that einstein so once the religious mind has gone once a religious mentality which is basically come along and lead me, tell me what to do. I don't want to take responsibility for my own life because I might get into trouble if I do the wrong thing. So that's what the religious mentality is. And that's why people are lazy and that's why people are scared. And that is still in people today. And that's why people, including scientists, even though they've long forgotten any religious thing, it's still deep down inside. We have epigenetics in our epigenetics to be to, to want to be ruled it's quite bad but you know we'll come out of it i have great faith in life life always goes forward we've only been here for half a second in the scheme of things and if we don't behave ourselves life will get rid of us the world has already gone into fever because we are infecting it and you know yourself if you have a, an infection your body will deal with it in certain ways but if it gets out of hand your body will go into drastic measures and you'll get diarrhea and you'll have uh, a high fever and hopefully this will kill the virus before it kills you and the planet's going to do the same thing it's going to do. anyway let's see what happens with that one the people are fearful and there is a decline in religious thinking and at the same time there is an incline in people producing um Para paranormal activity people are starting to believe it or not read each other's minds it's happening more and more often um the so-called heathen practices of the east are becoming more prevalent now it's just that scientists have to change the name for instance mystics have always known that meditation is an extraordinarily powerful tool but it's been poo-pooed by scientists for a long long time but now that they realize that it actually works they basically just change the name they call it uh, mindfulness now so they don't sound like hippies um and they like they would like the world to think that they discovered it but of course they didn't and they do this with a lot of things so while that's going on 
what I'm saying there is science is bringing these practices to the forefront, but they could do it a lot quicker. And they also need to understand that everyone used to be able to do these things before religions came along. The religious mentality, we all did it. We were all happy. It was always a golden age. Um, life and death was as normal as drinking water. You know, there's absolutely, we all knew that back then that um, there's nothing more natural than death and there's nothing more unnatural than the way we respond to it. That's, that's another insane thing about us. But there again, it's, that comes from the delusion that we identify with this tiny little pixel of a body and when it's gone, we think we're gone. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I think I'm just going over old ground now, Oliver. It's a mindset. Okay. A mindset. Uh, related to mindsets, um, I have one more question on unhealthy beliefs because um, – well, we don't get unhealthy beliefs just from religion. I mean, we could also say that in a way some we also get from science with the materialistic viewpoint and the idea that death is the end. And so probably some people think nothing matters uh, with respect to what I do because when I'm dead, I'm dead. So I've had right, kind of general psychological question on how you help your clients with unhealthy beliefs. What, what, what are the methods you give to them uh, if they want to overcome some unhealthy beliefs? What a great question. Exactly what I've already said, but this is how I do it. As you know, I have a clinic, and in my clinic, I majorly treat people with mental issues. I won't say illnesses, issues. Um, if you come to me and you have schizophrenia, and you are literally, you're hearing voices and you're seeing things, etc. All I have to do, and I would put you into a induced deep meditative state, and I show you how to do it. Once I've done it to you, you can do it yourself within seconds. It's very easy to do. So I plunge you into a deep meditative state to the point where you can sit back and watch your thoughts being schizophrenic. At that moment, you're fixed. Um, a very, very famous, another hero of mine, John Nash. Uh, you know John Nash, a beautiful mind. Uh, he did it on his own. He, he happened upon that viewpoint himself. He doesn't take medication for his schizophrenia. All he has to do when he's talking to a class of people, if someone comes in and talks to him, all he has to do is turn to his students and go, can you see this guy? And if they say yes, then he knows it's real and he'll talk to him. If the class says, no, we can't see anyone there, he, okay, so he knows that's his schizophrenia and he just watches that, but it's not an issue. Why should it be an issue? So, and that's how that works. So people come with unhealthy thinking, you separate them from the unhealthy thinking and the thinking stops and it's over. You don't need drugs. But that's something that only you that's something that only you can do to them. Is there anything if people can't come to you that they can do for themselves? Any advice for those people? How they can overcome these beliefs? Well, the first thing you need to do is know that your beliefs have nothing to do with you. They're just thoughts. You just gotta if you think them, they'll hurt they'll hurt you. If you watch them, they can't hurt you and you'll see how they make you sick. It's as simple as this, and you, you will have experienced this yourself at some point in a different way, Oliver. When you're laying in bed and you're quite happy and you've had quite a nice evening, and suddenly while you're laying in bed, feeling very blissful, your heart rate is very low, you're almost dozing off, and you think of something horrible that happened that day suddenly, and you notice your heartbeat starts to pick up and you wake up and you get a horrible tight feeling in your stomach. At that moment, what's your observation? I felt great. I had a thought and now I feel horrible. <laughs> that That's the problem right there. That should tell you everything. If you can sit back and be in bliss and be in peace, you watch the horrible thought come up, you watch the horrible feeling come after it, 
you watch the tensing in your stomach, but if you just watch those things with fascination, it's not a problem anymore. It's only when you try to get away from it. Triggers in being with it, you'll be very surprised at what happens when you be with your pain. Do you understand? Did that make sense? Absolutely, yes. I, I've heard it from other people in similar ways, so absolutely. Because, it's reactive, because it works. It's that simple. You won't get anywhere with beliefs. You'd be amazed. I knew someone, um, where was I? I was in um, Queensland somewhere in Australia, and I was doing a talk. And there was a gentleman there, and this man, he owned a business. He was about 45 years old, and I was talking about beliefs, the difference between a belief and a fact. And he just couldn't get his head around it, and he pointed to the roof, and he said, so you don't believe that if you were to walk across that roof and walk off the edge, you would just fall down and and break your legs. And I said, no, I don't believe that. I don't need to believe that because I know the fact. The fact is, if I walk off that roof and fall down, I will break my legs. It's a fact. I don't need to believe it. Belief is the complete opposite of a fact. So you don't need them. And it's our beliefs that do the problems. It's our beliefs that create the difficulties in our lives. Get rid of your beliefs. Get rid of your opinions. You don't need them. Replace your opinions with discernments and you'll be fine. Don't have any likes or dislikes. Just be and watch what life is doing. Stop adding wrong or right or any of that to what you see. And you'll watch life investigating itself right before your eyes and you being a conscious participant in that observation of life unfolding and enjoying itself and wondering what it is. Just watch that. I could give you exercises, but that would take another half hour. Okay, then, <laughs> then we won't do that. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. There are exercises. Some so, of the best ones are the ones. How long have I got, Ollie? Well, as much as you're willing to invest, I mean, I have time, so. All right, can I give you a quick lesson as what I would do? It'd be a very abridged version of what I do with people in my office. Sure. Yeah? If you're willing to, go ahead. Okay. Do you want to participate? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> as we know, our main problem is in here. If you can fix it in here, out here takes care of itself. Now your head is like a room full of confetti, millions of pieces of confetti. And on each piece of confetti is a piece of information. I just have to close the door. Give me a second. People are arriving. So. Analogy, your head is like a room full of confetti. Each piece of confetti has a piece of information, your name, your age, your car, et cetera, et cetera, everything that you think you know. Now, when you rush into a room and you're all emotional and full of energy, the confetti goes everywhere, flying around all over the place. You can't see the walls. You can't see the pictures on the walls. You can't see outside the window. Uh, you start to trip over furniture, et cetera, et cetera. It's a mess, basically. Now, a psychologist would have you walk in there and get all of the blue bits and put those in a nice little pile and all the red bits and put those in a pile. That can take lifetimes. The trick is this. When it's getting out of hand, you walk out the door very slowly, close the door behind you and go and do something else. When you come back in 10 minutes, nice and quietly, walk in the door slowly. All the confetti has settled onto the floor. You can see outside into the beautiful world again. You can see what's on the walls. You can see your furniture. And you can even find the vacuum cleaner and vacuum up all of the confetti. And your problems are over. Put that little story aside for a moment. I'm going to tell you now what meditation is and why it works. Everyone has a predication, and that means some people learn better by listening. Some people learn better by watching. Some people learn better by feeling or doing. They're tactile people. 
So if you're the kind of person that is a hearing person, you would get something like this. Now, I don't know if you can hear this properly, but see how long you can hear this bowl chime for. Can you see that okay? Yes. I think that chimed for about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Relaxed. I, I, I like those tones. I like to watch ASMR videos. I don't know if you're aware of ASMR, but there are some people who do ASMR with those. It's kind of a relaxing technique, and they use those singing bowls uh, as part of their element of their videos, and I like that very okay. much. So What's happened here, and you've just given me a fantastic example of what I'm about to say. Going back to the room full of confetti, when I hear when I hit this bowl and you're listening with the intent of listening until you can no longer hear it, you've left that room and you've gone into your ear. So you don't give credit to the bowl, you don't give credit to the people hitting the bowl, you don't give credit to the people making DVDs. You had the ability to leave your mind and sit in your ear and, and just listen to this sound and you left the room. And as you're doing that, the confetti started to sink. This is why meditation works. If you're not that kind of person, you would take your beads. Religious people call them worry beads because they give the credit to the beads, but it's not the beads. If I have a mind that is just, ah, and I'm full of worries and issues, Take your beads between your finger and thumb and you feel the first bead. You feel how cold it is. You feel, see if you can find any scratches or dents in it. You're not looking at it, you're feeling. Uh, you feel the roundness. You feel every single thing you can feel about that bead, where the hole begins, where the wire is going through the hole. Once you've fully covered that bead, you go to the next one and you do the same thing again. If that takes you five minutes, left the room for five minutes the other question is what are you that can go from there to here actually so if you're a tactile person that is how you get out of your head if you're a visual person you would use a candle flame um, or watch the waves on a beach the whole point is be with be fully in your finger and thumb be fully in your ear be fully watching the the, the candle flame or whatever. Now, two things can happen here. There's two levels. In the beginning, you are going to feel and see and hear these things somewhere inside your head, but it's an isolated area. It's like having a safety room inside your home. So there's an isolated area you can go into and do that. The confetti will still settle down around you. But as you develop that higher mind, because when you do come back into your head, if all the confetti has settled, there's a good possibility you will have an enlightening experience, which you are hopefully the only thing left in your head at that moment will be the dominating force, which will be the higher mind. This, getting back to your original question, when you do this, the unhealthy thinking stops, the unhealthy beliefs stop until you can get back in there. And momentarily, that will break the cycle between the unhealthy belief and your body's response to it. As I said, when you lay down in bed and you're full of bliss and all of a sudden you have a horrible thought, you can see the chemicals that get released into your body and now your heart starts to palpitate. The reason your heart's palpitating is because your body just released adrenaline into your system and perhaps cortisol, cortisol as well and they're gonna rip your veins to pieces. Poison yourself every time you get angry. Poison yourself every time you get upset. Gotta stop it. And these are ways, these are technologies that have been honed in over thousands of years. Simple as they are, and it works. A far more simple method than trying to put Valium together. And stuffing that into your body, that does nothing. So that's how you can do it. There are the exercises that will take you out of your mind. Of course, there are other exercises to take that awareness beyond the physical and get to the outside world. But the first thing you have to do is 
find that higher mind. And believe me, it's as simple as just watch your thoughts. When you're watching your thoughts, that's the higher mind. When you're thinking, that's the lower mind. It's that simple. So if you can sit back and watch your thoughts being silly, you're good. <laughs> That's how I fix people in my clinic. It's a lot easier when you're with them because you can put your own energy, you can take control of their willpower should they allow you to do so. Um, and that's much easier. And like I said, for me, it's a case of inducing an extremely deep meditative state to a point where you observe yourself in the same way you would if you were astral journeying outside of your body. It's almost like having an out-of-body experience. Um, just after I spoke to you yesterday, I was speaking to a, a student of mine in uh, Baltimore in America, and he's just had his first experience. He's been doing Qigong for a couple of years, but he's been doing it from books, and he's been doing it from people who think they know what they're doing, but can't give any evidence that what they're doing is actually working for them. So what happens? There's a lot of techniques you can learn from books and from public classes and all the rest of it, but there are keys. The keys that make the difference can only come from what's called transmission of mind beyond the teaching. Um, and that's kind of what I do with people. Uh, so this young gentleman, he's been doing his Qigong for a couple of years. He's been using his thoughts to direct his chi. He's been using his thoughts to do his qigong, and he has never developed anything from that. I've spent two, three hours tops with this guy, and I showed him the difference between the observer and the observed, the higher mind and the lower mind. Where I come from, that's called the host and the guest. The host being the higher mind because that's the part of you that was born with the body. The host is the mind that nature put in there. The guest came later. The guest is made up of a bunch of thoughts and opinions that were put in there by your parents and the teachers and the world around you. So that's not real. That's why it's called the guest. But it takes over your mansion. It becomes the boss. It becomes the dominating force. And you end up being forgotten in the attic. And that's the condition everyone's in at the moment. The lower mind is uh, ruling the world. I don't blame it all on religion. It's just that religion was the first one to take advantage of this observation in people and turned it to, well, you know, the rest. But that's how you do it. There's a few exercises that can help a lot of people. I think there is a video where I can talk people down into a deep meditative state. I think that's already on there. Um, and that's it. If anyone wants to come along and do a monthly interview uh, based on one particular question in order to learn things, then I would be very open to doing that as well. And then we can get, for nothing, of course, and then we can get some, some stuff out there that people can listen to and practice and just start taking control and responsibility of their lives and life will get better. Hope will start to show itself light at the end of the tunnel will start to reveal itself and everyone can be happy it's not impossible it's not even difficult you have to have the balls male or female <laughs> I didn't know what to say <laughs> okay that's all you. I know thank you for sharing that was very very interesting so I have one final question the last one for this interview, it's a very broad one. And um, so some people believe that humanity is headed for a global shift in consciousness. Others think that we are maybe headed for a huge global crisis. And I would just be interested in your take on humanity's future over the next decades. What do you see? What's in store for us? The next decades? Uh... Yes. Yes, sure. Uh... Well... I have a bucket list, and on my bucket list, I would like to die on Mars because I, I think 
by the time we get to Mars, I'll still be around in this particular body. If I'm not, I'll go there in someone else's body. So the only reason I can enjoy that bucket list objective is because we are due for yet another quantum leap in consciousness that is going to happen. It's already begun. We have to get rid of our um, the way we see time, the way we think about time, and then uh, you realize that things are happening very quickly. You know, it was only a hundred years ago that the Wright brothers got off the ground with an aeroplane made of balsa wood and, and rag, basically. But they got off the ground. A hundred years later, here we are walking on the moon. A hundred years later, here we are with the space station. A hundred years later, here we are with rovers all over Mars. That's a massive, that requires a massive jump in human consciousness. It wasn't too long before that that we were burning witches at the stake. Very, very, not very long at all before that. So we're moving very, very quickly, extraordinarily quickly. We are in the first quarter of a quantum leap in consciousness. If you go back to, now I apologize here if I get this wrong, I'm not sure if it was the Osteopithecus or the Neanderthals, but they had stone axe heads for a million years, and in a million years, no one thought to put a handle on one a million years to figure out, hey, let's put a handle on this thing. That was very slow compared to the way we're going now. If you look at the way we're going now, we are flying ahead. So don't be impatient because it is moving very quickly and human consciousness is expanding. Uh, a lot of it is due to the internet and uh, YouTube in particular because Let me go back a little bit. Before Hubble, the man that uh, they've named the Hubble telescope after, we all thought there was only one galaxy in the cosmos and it was ours. That's what we thought. Before him, if you had said to anyone, okay, I need you to imagine the cosmos, they can't, they have nothing to work with. You say, okay, just it's easy, fill it up with millions of suns and and asteroids and all the rest of it, it, they can't put that together. And that was only 50 years ago, maybe a bit longer, 50 to 100 years ago. Now, if you say to someone, imagine the cosmos, everyone's got a picture and it's big and it's full of galaxies. People even know the numbers, you know, a billion, billion stars, how many planets are around those. So the fact that we, we can picture these things, the fact that we have these visuals at our disposal now, means that our our consciousness is just it's moving too fast we're not keeping up with it i don't think we were ready for the internet to be honest it is killing people but that's evolution every evolutionary jump is usually because the last model isn't keeping up with things anymore so it comes up with a new model and that's where we're at you know, life is producing a new model right now I can tell you now, it's not going to be allowing a lot of the things that have destroyed this world, religion being one of them, we won't get to Mars while that is still an issue. I know for a fact that the authorities aren't going to let religion leave this planet. They're not going to let nuclear war leave this planet. If you believe that there's an extraterrestrial community out there watching things, um, that is having a quite an effect on the way the governments are doing things at the moment. I'm not going to go too far into that because that's a whole different genre of things. Life out there beyond the earth, but it has a lot to do with mysticism. It has a lot to do with what we are. It has a lot to do with what we, where we came from. We didn't originate on this planet. Everyone knows that these days. Like I said, that's another story. If you ever want to get back into that one, give me a call, Oliver, and we'll talk about that one. <laughs> I think we will. It sounds interesting already. <laughs> it is. It's brilliant. It is. Where do we go from here, friend? Well, I think 
we'll just have to agree on a part two because you already opened up so many other subjects here today. So I think we'll have to do this again in some time, maybe a few months down the road. Oh, I would love that. That would be fantastic. I'm actually looking forward to meeting you in person. That's well, if you come to Germany, then uh, we'll make that happen for sure. I mean, it would be great oh, if we can work that out. Yeah, I'm on my way. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much for your time. And it was a really great interview. Very interesting. Many, Very many deep insights. And uh, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. And thank you all for listening, if you are listening. See you, Oliver. Okay. Take care.